George Bruno with the 21 Report. We're at the 21 convention, the final event of the decade. And I'm having a conversation with Stefan Molyneux. Welcome. Thanks so much. Nice to be here. Yeah. What a talk you gave. What a response. I will let you be the judge of that. I mean, I enjoyed it. I actually went through two other speeches. And then last night, I'm like, mm, not feeling it. And I'm like, what do I really want to say? Well, you know, because on Twitter, I engage in these battles, so to speak, yes. where basic facts arouse yes. crazy responses. And I thought, OK, well, what is it that I'd really like to say, yeah. given that this is going to be sort of a permanent record? I think interesting to the audience and stuff I'd like to say to women. So uh, I worked on it like till late last night. I got up early this morning, worked on it some more. Because, you know, you want it to look effortless, but there's a lot of pre preparation to of make course. it look that way, right? Yeah. What was interesting was the, uh, the whole concept of when you know what the magic is, <clears throat> it's no longer magic. Mm. When you look behind the magic. Right. Uh, I want women to achieve real power, which in philosophical terms is, you know, reason, evidence, wisdom, virtue, like that's real power. Yeah. Looking pretty, look, I mean, looks are important. I mean, I'm not showing up here in a potato sack with like a coat hanger sticking out of my ear or something, right? right? So, you know, appearance is important, knowing your audience is important, being presentable is important. But it's really the wrapping to the gift, which is supposed to be sort of wisdom and, and virtue and all that. So for me, the more that we allow women's power to be based upon looks and sex appeal and the simulation of sexual arousal, which is makeup and, and the prominent display of butts and boobs, which is heels and all of that, um, the less they're encouraged to pursue virtue. And, you know, when you're a kid, and particularly when you're a baby, you don't care how pretty your mom is. You care how loving she is. You yep. care how reliable she is. You care how dependable she is. You care whether she's going to yell at you if you have colic and she's up for the third time that night. You need sort of patience and, and even temperedness and so on. And so it's funny because I think women experience what I'm doing as taking away their power. But I don't view it that way at all. I view it as taking away a bad power, so to speak, in order to, you know, get a good power. You yeah. ugly wallpaper, you take it off so you can get something better uh, underneath. So it feels like I'm taking something away, but I'm actually opening an opportunity for attracting a man through qualities of character rather than, you know, sexual signals. Fleeting things, yeah. Yeah, things that will pass. And, and here's the thing, too. We were talking about this the other day, that women's, like, peak sexual market value attractiveness is only supposed to last for a couple of years. And in terms of, like, you know, you reach, I'm talking way back in the day, right? Yeah. You reach sexual maturity. Within a couple of years, you're supposed to be paired off for life, right? Till death do us part, you know, mm -hmm. sort of mid-late mm -hmm. teens. Now, so your, your sort of hotness only is supposed to last for a couple of years. A year or two, maybe you got to pick a guy, right? A guy's got to pick you because, you know, everyone's getting picked, right? You don't want to be the last lonely kid, you know, being picked for the baseball team. And so we talk about sort of extended male adolescence, you know, oh, men are boys still until they're 30 and so on. But for women to milk that sex appeal, again, it's supposed to be a short, bright fuse, right? Mm -hmm. For them to milk it from like 18 to like 45, whew. That's a long time it is. to stretch something out that's supposed to be compressed and, and really focused on just a couple of years. Yeah. I noticed some of the most popular filters on the social media sites are these things that kind of brighten the eyes and give the big eyelashes and the, the rosy cheeks. And mm -hmm. I'm seeing women who are far past the bright eyed and rosy cheek <laughs> stage of life. And... Uh, and then the duck lips, you know, and then the cat uh, ears and that kind of thing. And, and I'm seeing this prolonged adolescence. Yeah. I, thought, funny, yeah. I thought it was bad with men. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it's funny because just by the by, when I first heard about filters, you know, because I'm a philosopher and I actually thought they meant like personal language filters about topics. So there's like, yeah. do you use filters on the internet? It's like, I am unfiltered. I'm right. like the most dangerous cigarette you can imagine. Right. right. Uh, but now I understand that they mean this sort of snap yeah. daddy kind of stuff. And it is weird because it is fundamentally deceitful, right? Because the whole purpose of us having sexual dimorphism, the whole purpose of sexual attraction and of sex itself is to make babies, right? Why are we attracted to women? Because baby making and continuation of humanity and, and so on. But here's the thing, of course, it doesn't matter if you put rouge on your lips, it doesn't matter if you get Botox. It doesn't matter if you get a facelift. There's no Botox for the eggs. 
Right. Right. So you you can't like the the, the decay. There's the no degree, right? Botox for the eggs. For the woman's eggs. Wow. There's no Botox for the eggs. Wow. So what she's trying to do is give you the signals. The yeah. eggs are younger than they are, but yeah. they're not. Yeah. There's no. But you can get those dino eggs, and you can crack out a baby later on in life. You know, yeah. but it's more risky. But there's no Botox for eggs, and that's the mm. fundamental deception. It literally is. It's much worse than a guy renting a car to make himself look. Wealthier, sure. or you know, taking a picture on a friend's yacht, or just yes. saying it's his or whatever, right? Because youthful signals of fertility don't alter the fact that the eggs are aging, and the, the there's no way back from that. Like by the time a woman is 30, 90 percent of her eggs are dead, and that's the eggs, the sperm, and the eggs. The whole reason why the, the whole game is played, right? It's the whole reason why we're attracted to women, why they have. So to me, taking away this really extended adolescence and this manipulation of men opens up the space for women to settle down earlier, to have some kids if they want them, and to not milk this male attraction far beyond what it should, how, how it should be milked or for the length of time that it should be milked. I'll tell you something in a little odd little thought too. I thought it was a couple of years ago. You know that there's a tradition that men make women laugh, right? Yeah. Now, so here's the thing. I can age 10 years by laughing, right? So I fairly, I don't have a baby face exactly, but fairly smooth skin and so I'm like 53, right? But you know, this, you know, right. it's like the moon, you know, like the, the, the Kalahari opens up and I laugh. So I think you, you can see this, if you make a woman laugh who's over 40, you can really see that she's over 40. Mm -hmm. Because again, Botox is kind of a new thing. But I think that one of the reasons why men develop the ability to make women laugh was to find out how old they are. Interesting. Because you can really see it when you make a, a woman laugh. It, she can go from like 25 to 45, like right. with one giggle. Right. So it's a kind of silly idea. It may not be true. It probably isn't. But I just thought that the men who invested in women they thought were younger had fewer chances to reproduce. So you want right. to find out how old the eggs are. And you can't do that. But one way to do that is to make the woman laugh and see what kind of lines are going on, right? Because you lose that subcutaneous fat for women in particular. Uh, around that age. So again, it's just probably a silly yeah. idea, but it's something I, I wanted to get it on permanent record, you know, like like the uh, Rosetta Stone. All right, there you go. It's, it's now imprinted. I don't have to say it again. Digital is forever. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Absolutely. Yes, for better and for worse. What should, or what is the best way for a man to look for a woman? The best way for a man to look for a woman is to improve his own character. You know this ridiculous, it's kind of a goofy movie, right? Like if you build it, they will come. Yeah. Or you build the baseball and the ghosts show up and so on, right? Because I hear this from women too, like where are all the good guys? Well, so first of all, there's these kind of layers in society. And I know this because I've tunneled up and down these layers in my, like I born, it's funny, I was born pretty poor. I went to a fairly upscale boarding school for a little while from sort of ages six to eight. I was sort of lower middle class in England. We came to Canada, just dropped. You know, mom ended up on welfare. We got eviction notices. I went right down, right yeah. down, really close to the bottom. Not like homeless, but like three days from homeless kind of thing, right? So right down there, and you see the people who are down at that level, and it's really dysfunctional. Mm -hmm. And and then I started to, like, I can't live there. Like, that's horrifying, right? That's yeah. like a Dante and Dostoevsky nightmare. So I tried to tunnel up. So, you know, I went to school and, and then I um, co-founded a software company. And then like I'm up there giving presentations to banks and Fortune 500 companies and, and selling software and, and hiring people. And so I'm, I'm tunneling up. We sell the company. We're listed on the stock market. It's like, whew, I'm up, right? And, and so having done this like wild oscillation between the classes and the levels and the layers, you really see how many people get stuck there. People can get stuck on the higher level, but then you can always fall down for economic reasons, right? But the lower levels are really sticky. Now, so people, like when you try to break out of that, there's a lot of hostility because people get, um, they get wed to this identity of where they are. And then they think, oh man, it's the system that's keeping me down. The system. The system. Now, if it's the system that's keeping you down, nobody should be able to go up, right? And if you're trapped in a sub, you can't swim to the surface, right? right? So if someone tunnels up, then it can't be the system alone. And that kind of choice is so people are, they'll hang on to you. It's kind of subtle, but they'll kind of hang on to you and keep you down, right? Crabs in a bucket. Crabs in a bucket, right? So when I, so you have to figure out where you are, not just in sexual market values, that's going to pass, right? Where you are in terms of human quality. Now, I don't mean to say everyone who's rich is high quality and everyone who's poor is low quality and so on, but it's not a totally unknown correlation, right? right. And so 
you have to improve your station. It doesn't mean wealth necessarily, it doesn't mean professional success, but just in terms of quality. You have to have quality people around you because when you start dating someone, if they have half a brain, which you want them to have if they're gonna date you, they're not just gonna look at you, they're gonna look at your social circle, you're gonna look at your family, your opportunities, your possibilities and so on. And that matters, and that really matters. So if you improve, your, improve yourself, like most people when they're young, I know I did, you have your dead breed friends, the crabs who are gonna right, keep you down, the people who are going nowhere and they don't want you to go anywhere either. The people who will try and seduce you into, hey man, you know, I got some joints for the weekend, I've never smoked marijuana, but you know, like the people who are like, let's go partying this weekend or, you know, let's go have a, let's go to Cayuga Beach up in Canada and you know, just like get wasted this weekend. And it's like, yeah, okay, you can do that a couple of times, but it's not gonna add much to your life. So if you've got the deadbeat friends, the loser friends, the friends who are gonna hold you down, they're not just holding you down because any quality woman or man is gonna come into that environment, look at your friends and say, oof. You know, these are the people gonna be hanging around when we have kids. These are the people hanging around when you wanna get a promotion in your career or whatever. Right. So you surround yourself with quality people, you work to improve yourself, and that can be economic and that matters. It can be other things too. Work to uh, elevate your conversation, you know, read uh, and, and learn how to be a good conversationalist. And, and then you'll just be moving in a different layer in society of, of quality. Yeah. And, and you can't find the quality people down at the bottom. And again, the bottom's not just money. You can have rich people down at the bottom too, right? When you think of the rich drug addicts or whatever, right? Yeah. So you got to improve. you got to drill your way up into a higher place where the quality people are because you can't find them down here. They're not bungeeing down for charity to get married to you, right? They just, right. they don't want to go there. I don't want to go back there. I never will, right? So drill your way up, improve your quality. And I hate to say, so for men, it's a bit more pursuit. For women, I say, you know, if you improve your quality, the man will find you, right? But for men, it's like improve your quality and hold those standards high, which means you've got to grit your teeth and you've got to punch yourself in the sack if you have to, to stay away from the sirens, right? Yes. The women who are just... Hot and unstable, right? Yes. The hot messes, as they call yeah. them, right? So, you know, look for the quality women, build your own quality. And, you know, it's this wonderful saying from the Polonius, who's kind of a fool, gives to his son, right? He says, uh, well, neither a borrower nor a lender be. And then he says, above all, to thine own self be true, for then it shall follow as night follows day. Thou canst not be false to any man. Be true to yourself, be true to the quality within yourself, and it will be effortless to find a quality partner. Is a virtuous woman different than a virtuous man? Yes. <laughs> Let's yes. talk about that. Well, we all have things that stimulate us and are dangerous, right? So for men, the great danger is, is as I said in the speech, status, right? So you want to have status and you want to have resources, but you don't want to do it through praying and controlling and belittling and diminishing others, right? So state, like, the men who reject status completely, uh, this is like the, um, the perpetual adolescent, the mom's basement, the incel, whatever mm -hmm. it is, right? Mm -hmm. So the men who reject status completely don't progress. The men who are all about status end up kind of shallow, right? And they're just in pursuit of material gain and, and they tend to be uh, very um, hostile and judgmental and, and not emotionally available, particularly for women. So have a good balance with status, right? So that's the great challenge for men is to be driven by status, but not ruled by status. I think that, that's really, really important, or to, to allow status to inform you, but not dominate you. For women, the great challenge is vanity, right? It's a great challenge, vanity, is, and it, it, this used to be well-known in society, right? It used to be well-known in society that vanity was one of the great weaknesses that women have, and vanity is hypergamy, it's monkey branching, it's the desire for male attention, it's playing around with flirting outside of your primary relationship as a means of reinforcing your ego and so on. Now, women who don't have any vanity, who let themselves go, so to speak, they're not very attractive, right? You can think of it's a harsh term, you know, like the land whales or, you know, the yes girls or mm -hmm. kind of things, right? Seize the day and eat it, right? So the women who don't have any vanity, who just let themselves go, are kind of undateable, right? Because obesity in particular means you can't get pregnant very easily. You've got health issues and joint pains and it's just you can't run around with your kids and so on. So for women, some vanity, very important, like for men, some status, but for women, too much vanity, and then the media knows this, which is why they're constantly plying on women's vanity, right? Oh, men are goofy, and men are silly, and men are dumb, and you're smart, and you're wise, and in any conflict, the woman's always right. 
men would be insulted. It'd be like, man, stop trying to fluff me. Stop blowing smoke up my ass. Yeah. I don't know what the yeah. phrase is. This is yeah. the same here in the States. Like, just stop praising me so much because you're manipulating me. But women never seem to get enough mm -hmm. uh, of that stuff. It's really, really uh, dangerous. And it mm -hmm. really is. And for men, it's like the tough guy, um, abs and, and Lamborghinis and crap like that can, mm -hmm. can go kind of crazy. So for women, the, the, the woman's virtue is, um, is, is connection, particularly if she wants to be a mom, right? It's, it's support. Uh, and its connection, and for the man, well, you have to go out and challenge the world and win resources for your family, but without harming people, right? And and that's the big challenge, right? Because it used to be more of a zero sum game, right? Like someone someone gets the hunt, you don't get the hunt, yeah. right? It's as if someone goes and picks that apple, you don't get the apple, right? Now with the free market, it's more of a win win. So finding a way to go out, fight the world for the resources you need for yourself and your family, but without preying upon exploiting and diminishing others. That's that's a real challenge. Uh, and I think those two particular approaches to virtue build the best foundation for family, in my experience. Is there a female equivalent of an incel or the guy living in his mom's basement? Yes. Yes, but I think it's the mirror image. I mean, you could sort of go, so in, in Japan, they're, they're called the dry fish ladies, right? The women, they barely go out of their home and they don't want to date and so on. That to me is not. So to me, the woman who sleeps around is to me the mirror image of the incel. So the man who has no sex is not part of the procreative nature of society. But the woman who jumps from bed to bed is also not part of the procreative nature of society. The man who doesn't bother, you know, getting up and, and grooming himself and going out to get a job and get resources and date or whatever it is, uh, he is you know, undermining the continuity of our culture and civilization. And the woman who just jumps from bed to bed is doing the same thing. So to me, the deficiency of sex on the male side, the equivalent for the female side is the excess of sex as well. In other words, one person is spreading infertility, the other one is spreading STDs and also heartbreak. Right, because every time you you get involved with someone and it doesn't work out, you know, harms your pair bonding. It makes you more suspicious. It hardens yeah. your heart, and so on. And you know, now we have this terrible situation where feminism, by keeping women unattached for so long, and women, of course, have very high standards when it comes to male attractiveness. Like we know that eighty percent of men on dating sites are red, like eighty percent of men are rated as at or below average looks. Right. So I mean, this, so the top ten or twenty percent of the genetically gifted men are making out like Turkish sultans, like they're just yeah. making out like bandits, right? Yeah. So in other words, by not having women pair bond and attached to men, you know, go no slut shaming and you go girl and sex power and all that. What's happened is the top tier of men are making out like bandits and the women can't lock them down into a relationship. So it's actually created a kind of sultan style harem patriarchy mm -hmm. in the pursuit of sexual liberation has made women slaves to alphas that they can't lock down and then they get I hate to say sort of used up or damaged goods, but their pair bonding gets significantly impaired. They may have an STD, unwanted pregnancy. They may have had an abortion. It really wrecks their heart. And then they get hard-hearted and they say, well, there's this patriarchy. And it's like, well, it's a bit of a sexual patriarchy, but it's kind of being created by feminism. And that, I think, is really, really rough. But I think women are kind of waking up to that now mm -hmm. and saying, you know, the supposed freedom, you know, and the devil offers you freedom, but it comes with a whole lot of chains at right. the end. I'm divorced 16 years. I've dated. <laughs> I you were going to say 16 times. Yeah. <laughs> like, 16. Wow. Years. I yeah. feel like we've been married and divorced <laughs> already. <laughs> All right. Once is enough. And uh, you were divorced 16 years ago? Yeah. Okay. So going and dating women over the years and going to their house, and you're sitting at the dining room table, kitchen table, and a 25 year old comes up out of the basement with a nose ring on, a boy all tattooed up. Oh, this is my son. And I'm like, oh boy, this is trouble. And I, you know, I just make a decision right then and there. This is my last visit to this house. Mm. And then, and this was going on 10, 15 years ago. And then we started hearing the phrase, oh, you're probably living in your mother's basement. Mm. And that rang true to me because I've seen that several times. But one thing that popped out to me, no one ever said, you're probably living in your father's basement. Right. Why, why is it that way? Right. Well, it's the same thing that if I criticize some aspect of modern femininity, people say, 
uh, oh, you have mommy issues, right? You've heard this a million times, yeah. right? But when a woman criticizes a man, nobody says she has daddy issues, right? That doesn't usually come up. So the mother's basement, particularly with regards to the men, is kind of important because women can't teach boys how to be men. I mean, it's, it's such an obvious and simple truth that women cannot teach boys how to be men. And it's funny because, you know, when you, you look at feminists and they will say, well, the reason why there aren't so many female engineers or, or physicists or whatever is because, you see, they don't, they're not mentored. They don't see examples. They, they, they don't know that they can do that kind of stuff. So basically, they're saying that male scientists can't inspire girls to be female scientists right. or whatever, right? So they need mentors. They need examples. But then you turn around and say, well, boys need fathers. And they're like, no, they don't. And it's like, come on. I mean, this is not even remotely credible. Or, you know, on Twitter, people will say to me, well, I don't, the woman will say, well, I don't need a man to have a baby. You know, and technically, you've got to get a sperm donor or whatever, right? You've got a one-night stand. Sure. But it's, it, this is the thing. It's not, I say this, it's not about you. It, it's about what's good for your children. Mm -hmm. And your children need fathers. Right? Your children absolutely desperately and totally need fathers. So the mom's basement is really powerful because it's a number of things. First of all, it implies fatherlessness, which is a huge tragedy that is really wrecking our civilization in many ways. And secondly, there is something very powerful in that because... The boomers got a lot of wealth, right? I mean, they, they were um, in, in, the, in the 70s and 80s, a lot of wealth gathering, lower taxes, less regulations, less competition for mass migration. So the boomers were able to accumulate a lot of wealth. And one of the reasons why things are worse for the next generation is they're living off that wealth of the boomers without having the opportunity to create that level of wealth themselves. So the boomers, the richest generation in history, after that, it's kind of all going downhill. The boomers could get houses for about 1.4 to 1.5 times their salary, which is staggering yeah. to think of, right? Yeah. Staggering to think of. The equivalent now would be that you could get a house for 80,000 or $70,000. And it's often 10 times that amount, right. right? The real estate has gone completely mental, and it shouldn't have, mm -hmm. because yeah. after the baby boom was the baby bust. Yeah. So as the boomers move out, the housing prices should be collapsing. But they, the, the financial system can't handle that, mm -hmm. so they import a bunch of people to prop up the housing prices. So it indicates not only that there's fatherlessness, but it also indicates that you're living off the wealth of your parents. You're living off the wealth of your boomer parents, usually. And it's funny because that wealth still being concentrated in the boomer parents through real estate prices being high is one of the reasons why there's not that much future for the younger people. Because they, what's the point? I mean, you go out and get a job, you might have significant student loans, uh, you, uh, you, you can't afford a house, uh, you can't get your life started, and then you want to date some woman, and she's like, oh, I got $100,000 in student loans. It's like, oh, man, how on earth are we supposed to get anything going? So to me, you can't blame, you can't blame young people for the society. They didn't make mm -hmm. it. They weren't born when all these decisions were right. made. They didn't choose to have massive unfunded liabilities and national debts. They didn't choose for school quality to collapse. They didn't choose for it to be a gynocentric teacher daycare monopoly of, of females, and they didn't choose for mass migration to prop up real estate values. I mean, they, they, and, and, but you, 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 you take these big socioeconomic forces and you concentrate it on one individual and you say, you're a failure. Mm -hmm. And you know, failure to launch, where's there to land for kids these days? Like why? I mean, and, and plus, not only has the outside world become progressively less accessible for success, but now, you know, your pornography and, and, and video games and endless entertainment on, on YouTube and other places, and it's like outside is less attractive and inside is way more attractive. And what can these young people do? The voting block of the boomers is staggeringly huge. And what can these individuals do? So I don't like blaming individuals for larger socioeconomic forces, while at the same time, you still have to retain free will and individuality and so on. Mm -hmm. So it's a way of taking all the sins of society and ladening it down on, on particular people that have remained fundamentally exploited and unprotected in society. And I think it was wrong. Yeah. Cancel culture is a rehearsal for mass murder. Yep. Wow. Absolutely. There was a hush in the room when you said that. That's true, though. Talk well, about probably that. because it's true, right? Yeah. Probably because it's true. Yeah, so cancel culture is uh, unpersoning. Unpersoning. Uh, do you know when this, this is a phrase that comes from old dramas where 
often it would be the son who would displease the father, and it would be some big, big item. And the father would you know, draw himself up and get this sneer on his face, and he would say, you're dead to me, yeah. right? You're dead to me. So that's cancel culture in a family, right? You're mm-hmm. dead to me. And when you unperson people from the internet, you've killed them from the public consciousness. Mm -hmm. Now, it's not because you've engaged them and found them wanting. Hey, listen, I'm happy to harm people's views if they're wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, like if I engage in a robust debate with someone and people start unfollowing them because they're wrong, that's perfectly fair. I'm not demanding that they be unplatformed or anything like that. But when you vanish people from social media, where does that go? Where does that end? You're saying that their views are unacceptable and should not be held in the public square, should not be available in the public square. Well, that is a terrifyingly, narcissistically, megalomaniacal approach to truth. There are people I massively disagree with. They should absolutely have the right to make their case in the public square, and I will engage with them because I want to know the scope of human thought, and I can't do that if people are driven underground. Mm -hmm. And, hey, I could be wrong. You know, I mean, having the humility and wisdom to know that you could be wrong is so important. So we know that the left, when it gains power historically, kills people by the thousands, by the hundreds of thousands, by the millions, and sometimes even by the tens of millions. Mm -hmm. They kill class enemies, they kill who they call counter-revolutionaries or reactionary reactionary forces, they call them, they kill large property owners, landowners, the kulaks, They, they kill, they kill, they kill. And cancel culture is a presage for that. If you silence someone from the public square, you've killed their capacity to engage with other people. And that's not fair, that's not right, that's not reasonable. And we know where it leads. Of course it does, they don't start off. I mean, it's like, you know, if if you're in an abusive relationship, the guy doesn't like punch you on the first date. You know, like there is a grooming period, there is a wooing period, there's a what can we get away with period, right? Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing when the left cancels people out of existence. It is a rehearsal because they never stop there. There is always an escalation from there. And because they're anti-Christian, fundamentally, Christianity says that all that is coerced or anything that is coerced cannot be moral because you have to have free choice to choose virtue. If, If you're forcing people, it can't be moral. If you silence people, you haven't won a debate. Mm-hmm. You've lost it, right? I mean, I don't know, when you're kids, right? I would have lots of debates with people. And it never ended with that, oh, shut up, shut up, shut up. It right. never ended with la, 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 right? Yeah. Because that would be confession that you've lost. You can't yeah. handle it anymore. So cancel culture is a confession of that you've lost. Now, what do the leftists do when they lose? Do they say, oh, well, you know, I guess it was the wrong idea. We're going to become capitalists or whatever. No, they just, they double down, they escalate, they dodge. It's... For whatever reason, that's what they do. And of course, it doesn't stop. You yeah. know, it didn't stop with Alex Jones. It didn't stop with Andrea Anklin. It didn't stop with uh, Milo Yiannopoulos. It didn't stop with Laura Luma. Of course, it just continues. They're all test cases or what they call trial balloons. Mm-hmm. When are people going to push back? Mm-hmm. And they will keep escalating it. They gain control of the reins of power. And you can see this in Europe. You get hate speech laws and people being thrown in prison for sharing videos. And I mean, it's it, it just is going to continue to escalate. And you know it's a whole lot easier to stop a snowflake than an avalanche, and that's why I'm constantly promoting this: this let people speak. Yeah, I remember uh, in 2016, I think uh, I forget what university was right here in Florida. Spent six hundred thousand dollars on security when Milo was coming to speak. Yeah, six hundred thousand dollars. Oh, I've had the same deal. Amazing. Yeah, I've had the same because they say, well, you have the legal right to speak, but if we threaten the venue enough, they'll either cancel. Mm-hmm. Right, which has happened to me multiple. There's a reason this is my first time out in public uh, for about a year where I've actually yeah. been able to see an audience, right? Yes. Or what they do is if the venue has to continue or decides to continue, the, they escalate security costs to the point where you go bankrupt trying to give a speech. Right. And again, that is, you know, what do they do with their enemies when they gain power? Well, we know this historically. Yeah. They line them up and they shoot them. Yeah. And this same rage to silence others, it is, uh, yeah. That's why I very much stand by this address rehearsal. I was begged by a few friends not to go to the Night for Freedom in New York City. I believe you were there. I was. The first one. And uh, I decided the day before that I wasn't going to go. 
and I was talking with Mike and I was going to give a few words there that night. So instead, I decided to watch various people's live Periscope broadcasts. And I watched a man get assaulted in real time. Yeah. And I, you know, this was the Jewish man who, who left, right? Hit yeah. the venue. Yeah. And yeah, the guy just went to prison. Right. I yeah. saw that. And I'm, I'm glad to see that. And I remember watching some of those broadcasts from inside the club there where you all were uh, talking and speaking and so forth. It looked like a fun event. And wasn't it even as, uh, even six hours, eight hours before the event, the planned venue? Uh, yeah, that's a very common. And then, then, common and then at the last minute, you had to find a new venue. Well, that within was, all just Mike, a few that was all Mike Cernovich. I was there to help, but uh, the primary, I mean, he was the guy. And it was incredibly stressful. And he handled it with great grace. But yeah, he did find uh, another venue. And we all piled in. And that night, I mean, that's what earned me my SPLC page, as far as I understand it, right? Mm -hmm. And that night, the, the contrast was, was astounding. Inside the venue, there was dancing, there was fun, different races, everybody's showing up, we're all having a great conversation, yeah. good time. I must have hugged and selfied 500 people yeah. like that night, right? Yeah. People who were like, oh man, your show is fantastic, or I don't like it, this, or I disagree with you about that. Same thing, same thing in Poland, we're going to have debates in, in, in a pub, and it was great fun. So the inside, there's you know, disagreement, there's love, there's you know, joy, there's selfies, and, and people telling me, they show me their baby pictures, I got married because of your show, it's wonderful stuff. That's the inside, and the outside, there's people screaming that they want to put bullets into us. Yeah. Right? That is, you know, that old saying, same planet, different worlds. Yeah. That is not a world that there's compromise. There's not a world where people can get along. You know, what is wrong with people's vision? I saw that and I, and I was like, oh, darn, maybe I should have went. It looked fun. It looked like it was, it was great. It looked like a fun night. Other people could watch that and be angered and go, look at all those, you know, fill in the blanks. Yeah. Uh, what happens, why do people have two different, why are there two different views of an event like that? Right. I saw a celebration. Yeah, I mean, and there were lots of people there who disagreed with each other, and we had yeah. a civilized and, mm -hmm. and positive time. So, I mean, there's a lot to it, but I think fundamentally, if I sort of boil it down to one thing, I would say this, that unfortunately, there are so many people dependent on government money mm -hmm. at the moment. And everybody knows that it's unsustainable. So we're in a situation, Titanic's going down, there aren't enough lifeboats for everybody. Mm. So people are really freaking out. Yeah. So the right wing, which I'm not a part of, but is not attacking me in the way the left wing is. So, you know, that's just the reality. Yeah. So the right wing, what do they want? Smaller government, lower taxes, more free markets, more voluntary human interactions, right? Now, for you and I, that's a good thing. Right, because we are confident of our ability to be productive and, and valuable in a, in a free market voluntary situation. Right now, flip that over to what you talked about before at the young man with the nose ring and tattoos and yeah. all that kind of stuff. Right, is he confident that he can go out into the free market and provide value and negotiate and earn a living and all that? Well, probably not. Mm -hmm. Now, when you're in, and that's a whole different category from, say, a woman who has, you know, three kids by two different dads, who doesn't have really any skills, is living in government housing, relying on welfare and food stamps. So when we talk about lower taxes, smaller government, for us, it's a big positive, right? Mm -hmm. But what they do is they're like a farmer and we're setting fire to their crops, mm -hmm. right? We're invading their territory, we're setting fire to their crops, and they are going to starve in their mind, right? Mm -hmm. This is like now, the idea is like, well, you know, there'll be more economic opportunities, higher wages, you can get a job, you can all get together and babysit each other's kids, and you'll have a community, and it'll be better for you in the long run, and so on. That's not what they see. What they see is, I'm helpless, I am dependent, I am owed, and you're cutting off my food, and you're cutting off my electricity, and I'm going to die, and my children are going to starve because you guys don't want to share. Mm. Right? Now, that is a very terrifying position to be in. It's very helpless. And out of helplessness comes aggression, mm -hmm. right? I mean, you know, the cornered rat, right? The rat will try and get away yeah. from you, but when you've cornered it and it's helpless, it can't escape, it will turn on you, right? Mm -hmm. So if you look at Antifa and these other things, I've talked to one of these guys on my shows and, and talked to another guy, another two guys privately, they all come from single mom households, 
right? So Antifa need to be understood as the shock troops sent out by single mothers to make sure their benefits are not diminished. That's what they are. Interesting. That's what they are. So when we get together and they think that we're talking about cutting off food and health care to the poor, which we're not, but that's their perception, mm -hmm. right? Well, they're corn and animals because they, they believe that they cannot survive without the government money. And if we have issues with that, then we are, quote, trying to kill them. And hey, man, it's just self-defense. You guys can't be allowed to get your way because if you get your way, we're toast. Mm -hmm. Whereas I look at the left and say, well, if you get your way, I'm toast because I know history. And I'm, I'd be the first, first my, my big honor, I'd be the top 10 of people on the firing line, right? So when they look at us and say, if you get your way, I'm dead. And we look at them and say, well, if you get your way, I'm dead. Well, that's why I say, unfortunately, right now it's gone so far, there's not going to be a peaceful solution. I just hope it's not too bad. I noticed that you parachute into hot spots, San Francisco, mm. Hong Kong. I say to myself, gosh, I, Here. I, 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 I will. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. I will never go to San Francisco. Forget right. it. Right. Forget it. You're, you're packing your suitcase yeah. on your way to San Francisco. Well, I'm up there. I'm up there. Uh, I would went up to the city council. Yeah. Right. And I, I so if you saw the video, it's uh, fdrurl.com forward slash ca. If you want to see the sequence, I go up to city council. Say, how are you going to pay for all this? Like, you know, they've got 20 minutes to do Chinese drummers. Yeah. You know, but they don't have five seconds or 10 seconds to entertain how you're going to pay for all of these right. giant programs, right? So, I, I, you know, there is. This perception, of course, and I think it's quite true that Canada, sorry, that California is America's future. Or if you want to know how America is going to be in 10 or 20 years, you just look at California. Well, it's not pretty. Yeah. I mean, giant, biggest welfare state, biggest income disparities, most people on welfare, lowest quality of education, just about. I mean, just wretched stuff. High, high crime waves and homelessness is, is rampant. So you need to go to the guys who are smoking out of a hole in their throat to say, don't smoke, right? Mm -hmm. So you want to show in a sense, okay, this is the reality of where things are heading if we don't have important conversations. So, um, you know, I mean, I had security and, and all of that, but uh, actually I didn't, I didn't have security in Hong Kong when I needed it actually the most because of the tear gas and all of that. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, I mean, there are real things happening in the world and which is a silly thing to say because it's obvious, but when we have these abstractions, they, they translate into very real things, mm -hmm. right? So like socialist policies translate into women selling their children in Venezuela, right? And, and middle-class women like teachers and, and clerks and so on going across to Colombia and selling their bodies for sex to get food for their children. Like it, these abstract old ownership of the means of production, they translate into very real catastrophes for individual people. Yeah. And, you know, this is when people are breaking into zoos and eating the farm animals because they're starving. This is when the average weight loss is like 20, 20 pounds in a year. And you see these videos coming out of Venezuela where a guy's crashed his truck. He's lying there bleeding, half dead. People are stepping over him to get to the food in the back of the truck. This mm -hmm. is like the callousness and base level of survival that's occurring in these countries. So I do want to go to places and say, yeah, you can have your socialist policies. You can have your mass migration if you want, and you will end up with you know, typhus in your, in your town, and you will end up with feces all over the sidewalk, and you will end up with a truly deranged and out of reality city council. And, and there are people like, like Ellen Zhao, who's running for mayor, who I think would make a very interesting and powerful difference. And nobody knows, right? Or very few people know. So I wanted to get the word out with her and with Hong Kong. I mean, Hong Kong is, is an incredible place. I mean, you have two genetically identical people Chinese, you know, one had been under British rule for 150 years. One, you know, went through the collapse of a bunch of emperors and then the rise of the communists and now this semi-fascistic communist market capitalism thing that's going on. And the, the ferocity with which they're fighting for their freedoms in Hong Kong is, is incredible. It's deeply powerful. And these are people who take ideas very seriously and are willing to go literally to the barricades like mm -hmm. Les Miserables style in order to try and maintain their freedoms. It's the only place in the world where the free market is written directly into their constitution. And it's going straight up against the biggest Leviathan state in human history. Mm -hmm. Man, I mean, why wouldn't you want to be there? <laughs> right, right. Where is the next hotspot? Any ideas? And I know you think globally. Yeah. 
Well, I think this is going to sound a bit odd, but I think what's called Wexit in Canada, mm -hmm. I think it's going to, and you should see the spikes of the searches for Western separation right after the election of Trudeau, yeah. which is a complete catastrophe for Canada. It could only have been worse if he'd gained a majority, but given he's going to team up, team up with the socialists and the NDP, it's maybe a distinction without a difference. Mm -hmm. But the next aspect of the West is people want to, to break up countries mm -hmm. because the Fisher lines culturally and, and ideologically are so stark and in opposition. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it's like it, you can have different denominations of Christianity, certainly post-Reformation, separation of church and state live together relatively amicably, but not if, you know, I don't know, one worships Jesus and one worship, worships Satan, right? That's going to be a bit tougher yeah. to, to get along with, right? And there's been so much demonization of people with different opinions from the left. They claim to love diversity, but it's really just crippling uniformity that they, they are after. I think that what's going to happen, and they tried this with Brexit to split away from Europe. They're going to try this various places in the America. There's going to be real talk of secession. It has to be because people do not believe. If, if Trump fails in terms of what people wanted him to do, which I think he will, then there's going to be separation. There's going to be separation uh, in, in Quebec. It's going to be interested in separating. The only reason Quebec's not more interested in separating is to get so much money from from Canada, as Justin Trudeau says, Canada belongs to Quebec. But yeah, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta in particular, is getting completely pillaged by the rest of Canada through these equalization payments, and they are not allowed to uh, pursue the, the exploitation of the natural resources. So they are like completely hamstrung. I think that we're going to start to see very, very serious movements in the West towards the breakup of existing countries. Mm -hmm. And I think that's kind of a desperate move. You know, people say, oh, let's just build a wall around California. And it's like, well, they'll just jump that wall too, right? I mean, yeah, right. people don't just sit there and say, well, it's a different country, so I'm just going to starve here, right? I mean, we're going to have to face this ideology and its effects head on at some point. But for now, people are going to start talking about separation. Mm -hmm. That's going to happen. People are going to try and get out of the European Union as much as possible. It's getting progressively more difficult. I think the union within Canada is going to be threatened. The union within America is going to be threatened, particularly post-Trump, because post-Trump, as the demographics change, you're going to get more and more crazy lefties into power. That's inevitable because they're importing people who vote for socialism. That's the whole plan. And once people realize there's no Trump 2.0 and you can never, ever get a Republican elected as president again because of demographics, people are going to say, okay, we're, we're out. And man, then it's going to be funny because all the people who claim about you know, like white privilege and, and, and white domination and so on will be like, oh, wait, the white people want us to seat? Well, we can't let that happen, right? Because they're the taxpayers, right? So... Uh, I think that's it, the hot spots. I think going to be all around us, and those battles are going to be fought politically and in people's living rooms. Why were we, as an organization, the Twenty One Convention, embraced by Poland, as we thought about taking taking the show on the road to Europe, and discussing what countries we could possibly go to? It's like, well, let's go to the UK. Oh no, let's go to Sweden. <laughs> oh no, and then it ended up. Being in Poland. Yeah. And Poland embraced us and our message. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that is? Hmm. Well, Poland, of course, having recently tasted the bitter fruits for many decades of totalitarian rule, is very interested in free thought, free expression, which is why when I went to Poland to film a documentary, I could just put the word out on social media and meet with people, and we didn't have to worry about bomb threats or death threats. The same thing in Hong Kong. In Hong Kong. So, I mean, Poland... One of the big differences is it's, of course, largely white, although that's not the sole reason, may not even be the most important reason. But there's just, think of the amount of energy that multiracial societies expend screaming racism at each other and trying to figure out the causes of disparities and outcomes between different ethnicities and so on. I mean, it's, it's bloody exhausting, and it's a huge waste of time, energy, and resources because it doesn't seem to fix anything. It often makes things worse. But I think, primarily, I would say it's the Christianity. Mm -hmm. It's the Christianity. Um, when people agree on large moral ideas, society remains relatively friction-free. Yeah. You know, like when you're kids, you make up a bunch of games with your friends, right? Like, but if you all agree on the rules, for the most part, the game is relatively friction-free. And in, in Poland, given the central nature of, of Christianity to the culture and its united opposition to... Um, communism to socialism to leftism and to mass migration 
you have a group of people who all agree on the same basic rules, which means that they're free to disagree on everything else. But if you can't agree on the same basic rules, everything is fractious and conflicted. Hmm. Well, we've gone around the world in about 30 minutes here. And in our last talk, you ended your speech, and I had you look at the camera and, and talk, <laughs> talk to that person out there that was why it was the patriarch convention. And uh, one phrase really uh, stayed with me. It was get married, have babies, save the world, mm -hmm. that, that type of thing. Yeah. Uh, considering the theme of this conference here, talk to the people who will be watching this right now. What message do you have for them? Sure. It's a very, very interesting question. There is a moment of enlightenment or potential enlightenment that can happen to everyone and anyone on their life's journey. And this, not because of me or the, even the convention, this can be yours. Because if you've only heard about this convention or you've only heard about this gentleman or myself, you've heard some pretty negative things. Right, like who was a bunch of misogynists getting together. I'm a, a nationalist, white supremacist, Nazi, whatever it is, right? So you're told all of these things. And that's an illusion of words that is created around particular individuals in order to have you not hear what we have to say, to dismiss us ahead of time, to not engage with us at all. Now, that's a fascinating thing. So there's two possibilities. Number one, we are really, really terrible people who want to just infect you with the worst conceivable ideas and, and turn you against all that is good and virtuous and true in the universe. And your wise elders and the people in the media and the people in the higher education and, and all of the organizations that identify hate groups and so on, boy, they're, you know, they're just really looking out for you and your best interest. There's no ulterior motive. They have no agenda. They're just trying to protect you from really, really terrible people who want to fill you full of terrible ideas. That's one possibility, but there's another possibility. There's another possibility. Now, the other possibility, which is the truth, is this, that the people that those in power tell you are the worst are generally those who threaten those in power the most. So what is it about what I do and what you do and what this convention does that threatens people in power? Men pay the majority of taxes and receive the fewest benefits from the state. We are the toiling masses. We are the exploited proletariat. We are the tax, cattle, and economic slaves of the system. How does a slave owner feel when the slaves begin to discuss freedom among themselves? Is he pleased? No. That slave who begins these conversations is about the most evil troublemaker that can be imagined, and by God, no other slaves better listen to that slave. Or disaster will occur, and he's actually kind of right, <laughs> because disaster will occur, but for the slave owner, not for the slaves. Liberation and freedom will occur for the slaves. So you have a choice, because you hear things about me, about us, and then you actually hear us <laughs> and the arguments that we make and the facts that we bring to bear, the reason and evidence we bring to bear on these important social questions. Now. The disparity, the oppositional nature between what is described and what is, is a monumental chance for enlightenment. Where does lightning come from? Clouds rubbing up against each other, bajoom, right? Now you've got a perception and you've got a reality rubbing up together. Generates great energy, great light, great heat. And you can harness that because we're not, we're not the monsters who are portrayed. The monsters are those who would use lies and slander to keep you from the arguments we have to make. Why focus on us? Why are we the ones that have to be silenced? You know, there are genuinely bad groups out there, right? There are, there are terrorists, there are racist organizations, there are like, you name it, right? But why is it us that gets all of this venom and all of this hatred from the powers that be? Do the powers that be have your best interests at heart? Do they hand you an economic system that's full of opportunity and freedom for you? Do they hand you an economic system where you're free of national debt? Do they hand you great schools full of wise, intelligent people who teach you how to think critically? 
do they hand you a sustainable economic system? No. Do you really think that they care about you? No. They don't care about you. They don't care about us. But they care that we care about you. They care that we want you to be free. They care that we want you to ask questions. The people like us that they're trying to chase you away from are the people who, to use an old phrase, can lead you to the promised land. And that's why you can't listen to us because you will really like what we have to say, but they don't. Millions of people are going to see this conversation on your network, my personal network, the conventions network. How can people find you who are watching you for the first time? I'm right here. No. So <laughs> you can find me on the web at freedomain.com, at Stefan Molyneux, S-T-E-F-A-N-M-O-L-Y-N-E-U-X is my Twitter account. And man, if you're not following that, I don't even know why you get out of bed in the morning. That is a fun account, man. And you can find me on youtube.com forward slash free domain radio. I used to be radio, but I've dropped that. So free domain radio is still my handle on YouTube. You can find me on BitChute on, on a wide variety of alternative platforms, Gab uh, and minds.com and so on. So yeah, just go to any of my videos. There's a whole list. If you go to freedomain.com, you can get you know, podcasts and videos, and there's a whole list of my social media presence there as well. And you know, I really invite you. I do, I do, you can send in questions, we can do call in. Our conversations together. I do interviews and lots of great stuff. So whatever you like, given the philosophy is the ultimate everything discipline, there'll be something there that will engage you. And I hope that you will join the conversation. Talking about freedom with Stefan Molyneux. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you very much. What was your experience so far with the 21 convention? Oh, outstanding, outstanding. Professional, all across the board. Really good energy with a lot of people. And uh, I just like it because it's a very positive, uh, positive direction. This, uh, George, this, is a, this has been a first class event. It's fantastic, you guys are in a really tight ship. I've been to a lot of conventions over the course of my business career and I can tell when things are well run and when things aren't. And this is a very well run operation. I was very impressed. It's pretty incredible to see where Anthony's brought it especially from last year, which is my first year here, and to see the, the upgrades he's made, it's been incredible. I've got my notebook, and with every speaker, I've written down about two or three lines mm -hmm. under each of the speakers of just just the key prime stuff. That I got. That's good, that's good. Yeah, it's, it's very surreal, man. I'm yeah. really enjoying it. I'm happy to live in such an era where such a thing like this is possible. I have never seen a group of guys like this, a group of 200 men who are focused, squared away, working on their values, just never met a bigger group of wonderful guys. It's kind of neat because I've been to a fair amount of conventions in my day, but you never see one where the guys like, uh, here you can just see Ed Lattimore talking to Tanner about boxing. Yeah. You just sit down and then you tell your boxing experiences, everybody's kind of pinging off each other. It's yeah. nice. It has been fantastic. And it's been four days of guys all on the same page, working in the same direction. Fascinating meeting some of the people, hearing their stories. You got, you got people traveling from other parts of the world to come here just to see yeah. some of the speakers. That's yeah. amazing. That's the thing that's impressed me is everybody here is very serious. Yeah. They're taking it you know, close to their heart. What a great convention. Thanks, George.